Um, we are starting a sermon series called uh, Strapped. And so if you're feeling like, oh, that's me, well, that's why we do this, all right? All right, let's start with uh, some prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you asking you to be with us in this time. We thank you, God, that you want to help us in every single situation we're in. And you've come down to help us, and we are asking for help today. And everybody said amen. 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 Yeah, so we're starting a sermon series called Strapped. And um, now... Churches talking about money always immediately makes people nervous. Oh, no. Well, we're going to help you today, and uh, we're not talking about giving or anything like that, so uh, we're going to help you today with some stuff that the Bible says about giving and uh, about specifically about what we can do with our, with our money. And so I, I know there's going to be some stuff today that's going to help your life. I really, that's the point. So um, I want to start with the foundation of this three-week series on the foundation of our hearts. Money and the heart are always connected. The Bible specifically says this. So we can't say, oh, money's not connected to me. It absolutely is connected to us. It's connected to our hearts. And we'll look at some scriptures about that in just a second. But we have to start with the foundation of our hearts. So that's why we talk about money in church, because you cannot separate money from people's, from people's hearts. So our first slide here, how many of you would be honest and say, I've done some stupid things with my money? Yes. Yes. I see that hand. Yes. Uh, yeah, I've done some stupid things with my money. I have done, uh, some, add zeros, right? <laughs> add some zeros onto some stupid things. So we've all done stupid things with our money. I think every hand was <laughs> raised there. So, and uh, we've all done this. We've all made mistakes. We've all got caught up in moments like that. And uh, maybe you're finding yourself strapped today. Well, I'm here to help. The Bible's here to help us. Our next slide, shake off the guilt of your past financial mistakes. All right, in the words of the great philosopher Taylor Swift, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. Yes, okay. The great theologian, Taylor. I'll do you a favor, not do the dance, okay? Yeah. Okay, so we've made some mistakes about money, but we have to just start right now and give yourself a break. You know, I mean, we didn't know what we were doing, and now we're going to know what we're doing. And we've made some mistakes, but you've got to let go of the guilt. If we're going to get to anywhere we need to be in this sermon series talking about this, we're going to have to start with let go of the guilt. So let it all go right now. Oops, you know, we made a mistake. I heard a story about a famous CEO, and he, had, uh, he was notoriously harsh on his employees. And one employee of him uh, messed up an account for millions of dollars. And he came to that CEO, and he said, uh, uh, you know, I'm sorry I messed this account up and I lost this account and it's worth millions of dollars and I'm very sorry. And he basically had his resignations ready to resign. He says, so, so I'm tendering my resignation. I said, what? You can't resign now. You can't quit now. I said, what do you mean? I thought you were going to fire me. Fire you? I just invested millions of dollars into you. <laughs> that education you just got right there was worth millions of dollars. I'm not about to lose my money on it now. You know? And uh, my dad's got a great story with working with my grandfather, Bill Shepard. Uh, in his car dealership, uh, my dad made a big mistake on how, many, uh, how much a certain uh, used car was worth. And he comes to my, his boss and also his father-in-law. Eh, that's rough. Uh, and he says, you know, well, what am I, you know, I made this big mistake. I lost this some money. He goes, all right, well, here's what I want you to do. And it was, a, it was a legit assignment. I want you to go back to your desk, write out all the things you messed up. And I want you to put a file folder in your desk called education. And he literally did. He made it, write it out, and he put it, filed it under education. Well, won't do that again, right? So file it under education, the mistakes that we've made, and shake off that financial guilt. Our next slide. See debt as bondage. Proverbs 22, 7. Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. The borrower is servant to the lender. Now, we don't like talking about this, uh, debt specifically, but first thing we got to do, once we shake off our mistakes now we've got to see debt 
as bondage. This word in the, in the Hebrew in Proverbs 27 for, for uh, bondage is, it means slavery. I mean, it doesn't mean like bondage. It means exactly what you think it means. It means you are owned by that, by that person. If you look at the, you know, the, the sermon ser- opener we just had, that person just strapped. He's in bondage. You know, we're strapped. We're in bondage. We're admitting it that we're in bondage. And when we're saying uh, we're in debt, here's what we're saying. I'm in bondage. And, you know, Sometimes we have different things we'd like to do in our lives. I'd like to start a family, but I can't because I'm in, I'm in debt. I'd like to buy a house because I can't because I'm in debt. When we're saying those things, we're saying I'm in bondage. Well, I'd like to, uh, you know, get a different job because I hate this job, but this is the one that pays the bills. And what we're saying is I, I've got this debt and I can't get out of this because I'm, I'm in bondage. Man, I'd really help to, love to help some needy people, but I can't because I'm in bondage. I'd love to go on that mission trip, but I can't because... I'm in bondage. And I don't want anybody, and neither does Jesus, doesn't want anybody in bondage. He doesn't want anybody in bondage. He wants us free. Jesus wants us free. And so we have to uh, take in the principles of Jesus to gain such freedom. Just like anything else, money's no different than any other part of our spiritual lives. If you want freedom from something, we've got to take in the life of Christ, take in the word of God, take in the principles of God. And as we take in the principles of God, the freedom begins to flow from us. All right, I got some facts here. Debt fact number one. The average household debt is now 136% of household income. Average American household debt. So, man, I, I, in this case, I want to be below average. Yeah. I would love to be below average. That means if they make $40,000, $50,000 a year, they're spending $70,000, $80,000 a year. Well, Listen, if I ran the church like that, <laughs> I no longer get to be employed here, okay? I mean, the only people that get to run like that are the U.S. government, guys. Everybody else, we lose our job if we run your factory or your business or where you work at. If they run it or this church or whatever, if you run it like that, you're, you can't sustain that. And we can't sustain it in our own family incomes as well. So these stats are startling, but let them... Let them startle you. Amen? You have a heart, you have a heart that's open today? Right. Yeah? Let them startle you. Number two, fact number two, the average credit card debt is $14,517. I did some research on credit card debt. The $15,000 in credit card debt is the average family credit card debt. Maybe yours is more, maybe yours is less. This is average. Okay, if you pay the minimum payment, it is designed to actually increase your debt. If you pay that minimum payment of $15, $20, $25, $30, whatever that is, at the end of that month, you actually now have more in debt. (laughs) In other words, if you only pay the minimum payment, you never ever go below the number you initially had, and actually you go above it at 18% interest. Ouch. I heard another thing, and this was, I don't know if it was a fairy tale or folklore or whatever, but most things that are being sold uh, on garage sales today um, are still being paid somewhere, somehow on a credit card. The remnants of them are still on credit cards. Wow. It, oh, ah. <laughs> I mean, that, that hurts, guys. And yes, that's right. If we stopped paying and just paid the minimum payment, we're all, we're going to forever have that. Well, once again, we're letting it go, right? No guilt, but let's, let's see that as what it is. That's just dangerous. And, and strapping, all we're doing is putting ourselves in bondage. Strapping shackles to our stel- Well, let's stop that. Amen. One another thing about, the, about credit card debt, on average, you spend twice as much when you swipe a card as you did if you paid cash. Because there's something about letting go of that cash that you don't want to do, right? If you're like me, you don't break the 50 or the 100, right? Right, I don't want to break it. I don't know why. I could have other monies that add up to 50, but that one $50, somehow it's more valuable. Anybody else, right? Because you don't want to see that go away. If it's a card, it's like, shoop, shoop, shoop. You don't care, you know? Hey, we're just swiping away. So it's, it's a trick on our minds because we don't really think it's money. <laughs> but guess what? $14,000 says it is money. <laughs> Debt fact number three. The average 21-year-old owes $12,000, but in only seven years they will owe $78,000. The, the average 28-year-old owes $78,000. The average 21-year-old owes $12,000. Let me, let, me, let me help some young people here today, okay? Um, there's a certain amount of, sometimes you've got to do debt for your, uh, for your education, etc. 
but stay away from it. What I've seen in some younger generations, even mine, I'm Generation X and the ones below me, um, they want to have the same things that their parents and grandparents worked their entire lives for. They want to have those things at 22 years old. Okay, that's not how it works. But in their heads, they think this is what people have, this is what I should have. That's not how it works. And so if we don't uh, understand that it's going to take 50 years to get those things, and you just go straight out there and get, you're going to straddle yourself with debt. And here's the, here's the crying shame about that for young people. They're starting out in so much bondage. You're supposed to start out as a clean slate, right? When you're a young person, it's like, I got the world. I can do whatever I want. I can go wherever I want. I can live however. But if we don't, if we straddle ourselves with that kind of debt now, unfortunately for the young people, they're not able to go do what they feel that they should do or what they want to do because they straddled themselves with debt. So as for you and me, let's just decide that we're going to not do that, right? Debt number four, debt fact number four, U.S. households living paycheck to paycheck somewhere between 55 and 61%. That means half of us, if we lose our jobs, we literally don't know how we're going to make any payment on anything beyond that. That's half of us. I would say we're an, we're an average group of people here today. More than half of us have just no savings, no nothing. We're, we're done for the moment we lose our jobs. And that's not the way God wants us to be. Okay? Our next slide. We are not called to be normal. Right? We're Abby normal. <laughs> right? Young Frankenstein? Yeah. We're abnormal. Jesus didn't live normal. His disciples didn't live normal. The first 100 years of Christians did not live normal. So let's stop this idea of what normal is. We're not called to live normal. We're called to be free. We're not called to be normal. We'll ca normal. We're called to be free. And the normal person's not free. The normal person doesn't have that freedom in their heart that they can do whatever they want or do whatever God calls them to do. The normal person straddled with uh, debts and mistakes and bondage and, and we, we got to just be breaking out of that normal stuff or what we appear to be or what we think to be normal. It's time to live differently, friends. It's time to view ourselves differently. It's time to live differently. See, normal's fighting over money in our marriages. Normal's divorcing because of money. Normal's angry because of money. Normal's rude because of money. See, normal is you're always going to have that car payment. You're always going to have those uh, credit card debts. You're always going to have those problems. So might as well just get used to it. That's normal. And I'm telling you what, there is a life that we can live that's beyond normal. God has it for us. See, I can even feel today there's a certain amount of resistance taking place from what I'm talking about today because the, the heart is connected to our money. And you're like, I, I want to believe what you're saying, Heath, and I want to, but I just, I've made mistakes and I, I know, but let's start a different path. Let's start a different path today. Let's decide we're not going to be normal anymore. We're going to be abnormal. We're going to start down the path to live in a life that's different than everybody else. Dave Ramsey says, if you want to live like, every, no, if you want to live like nobody else, you've got to live like nobody else. If you want to live like nobody else, you've got to live like nobody else. And I believe that. You've got to do different things in our life than everybody else is doing if we're going to get to where God wants us to be. Now, our next slide. Jesus talked a lot about money. I started doing some research on this. Two-thirds of the parables that Jesus preached on were about money. Two-thirds. So if he preached three sermons, two of them were about money. Hey, you thought I was bad. <laughs> It'd be like a money sermon, a money sermon, and then a prayer sermon. A money sermon, a money sermon, and then a, uh, uh, a faith sermon. A money, I mean, come on now. Why? Because he knew how connected it was to our hearts. One out of every ten Bible verses in the, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is about money. The Bible mentions money 23,000 times. 23,000. That is five times more than it talks about prayer and five times more than it talks about faith. Five times more. Five times more. Now, I'm not super good at math. That means like what? Like 4,500 times? It would talk about prayer and 23,000 times it talks about money? Because it's, it's a part of our lives. 
But somewhere along the line, someone's told us you're not allowed to talk about that in church. You're not allowed to have this discussion. This is a private thing that only the people are privately. Well, I tell you what, friends, if we're going to do church right, we're going to have to take all those private things and bring them out into the light. Amen. We're going to have to take the private things, by the way, which is I'm talking about, we're going to have to talk about love. We're going to have to talk about sex. We're going to have to talk about money. We're going to have to bring those things and look at what the Bible says about them. No more just having little hidden parts of our heart. No, at our church, we're going to just talk about everything because that's how our lives really are lived, friends. Matthew 6, 21, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Jesus was very specific. Where your treasure is, your heart is connected. Your treasure is connected to your heart, what you treasure. Now, there are two temptations about money, and the first temptation is we are tempted to serve money. No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. We are tempted to serve money. You're like, oh, well, that's not me. It says no one can. No one can. You have to choose. This is a T road, not a crossroad. You cannot go on straight through this crossroad. You have come to a T road. You've come to a place where you cannot go forward. You have to decide, are we going to serve God? Am I going to serve God? Or am I going to serve money? You cannot. He didn't say, it's kind of hard. You're going to say, you're going to have trouble with this. And you know what? Out of everything Jesus could have said that you cannot serve God and fill in the blank. It's interesting that's money, right? You cannot serve God and want to be popular. No, that's not what he said. You cannot serve God and look to, to, to fame and fortune. You cannot serve God and serve yourself. He didn't even say that. You cannot serve God and serve your own sexual desires. He didn't say that. He said, you cannot serve God and money. That's interesting, right? Because he could have put a lot of other things in there that we would have even said are more important, right? But that's what Jesus, Jesus gets to the heart of the issue, the hidden secret agenda of our hearts. Most of you would say, well, I don't serve money. I mean, come on, Heath, that's not how I live. I, I, I wouldn't do that. Well, hold on a second. If you've ever bought something that you didn't need to impress something, someone you don't even care about, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're serving money. If you ever thought, this is my hoard, this is my stack, this is my nest egg, this is my secret thing, this is my money that I'm hoarding. Wait a minute, well, we're supposed to put our faith in Jesus. I mean, that's nice to have, but be careful. If you've ever compromised your family and neglected your family so we could work those overtime hours and all those kinds of things. Man, I tell you, I just saw some research. Children don't care how much you make, they care how much time you spend with them. I think it's 80 something percent I think the stat is of kids that are just like just spend some time with me I don't care if you don't even give me Christmas presents spend some time with me but somewhere along the line we bought into the idea and we started serving money see we're tempted to love money our next slide we're tempted to love money first Timothy 610 for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil I was just having a conversation with this to somebody this week the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil it's not the root of all evil it's the root of all kinds of evil, and it's not the, uh, just money, it's the love of money. When you crave it, when you want it. See, money isn't good or bad. It is inherently neutral. You stack a big stack of money somewhere, it doesn't immediately go off and hurt people and kill people, and it just sits there. It's a neutral thing. It has no heart of its own. It's what is attached from humans to it that makes it so powerful. You can say, well, I don't love money because I don't have any. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm praying, I'll, I'll joke with the Lord. I know, I don't know if I should do that or not. I was like, Lord, I'd love to just be tempted by the amount of money I had. I'll still give, not give in to the temptation, but it'd be nice to just be tempted one time. You know? Then I could say no to it and feel like I've done something, you know. I haven't even had the amount of money that I could be tempted with. So you might be thinking, well, I don't have any, so, you know, well, listen, there's a lot of people that don't have it still crave it. They still crave it. And there's a lot of people that have a lot of it and don't care about it. They just might be good at doing what they do or, or what their career is. It just happens to be profitable, and they've got a lot of it, but it's like, hey, whatever, it's okay. It's just doing its job. It's just doing its thing. So many people misinterpret money, but it's just neutral, just a neutral thing. Here's what money is. Money is a magnifier of your heart. 
Money is a magnifier of your heart. If you've got a hard heart, money magnifies that hard heart. If, you've got a, if you're a broke jerk and you get a bunch of money, you're about to be a rich jerk. It just takes whatever you are and magnifies it. If you're a generous person with the $5 you got, you're going to be a generous person with the $5 million you got. Because it just takes what you are and magnifies it. See, it's just, that's all it is, like a magnifying glass. What is it, 85% of people that, uh, get, that win the lottery or end up being broke within three years? Because their hearts are not right and all that money did. They're not right because you're playing the lottery anyway. By the way, if you're doing that, stop that. Stop it. That is a voluntary tax by the government on you. I don't want to pay a voluntary tax. I don't like paying the taxes I gots to pay, let alone the ones that I don't gots to pay. Yeah. And if you're a Christian playing the lottery, I can just guarantee you, you will never win. Yeah, never. Why? Because God's not about to have that corrupt system of voluntary tax upon the fools. He's not about to have that be successful. And, and so people are like, oh, if I win the lottery, Heath, I'm going to give a bunch of money. Well, God's going to make sure you don't. <laughs> Oh, we're being honest now. <laughs> Let's do things God's way. Let's do things God's way. Don't put our trust in the Hoosier lottery. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. Put your Amen. trust in the word of God. Put your trust in the ways of God. Put your trust in the lifestyle from God. Right? It's the one that bears out over time. Our next slide, if you don't think you have enough money, you love money. Ecclesiastes 5.10. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Oh man, this verse hit me in the face. I'll just think about that and read that right there. I know for me, I have many times said, Man, I just need to make a little more money, or I need to have a little more money. If I just had a little more money, I would be... If you have that thought roll through your head, then the love of money is something that you're dealing with. Uh-oh. Friends, the Word of God. See, we all want to increase our incomes, but so very few of us want to decrease our outgo. Why do we want to increase our incomes? So we can have more stuff. Right. Or pay for the stuff we already said we we're trying to own. <laughs> That's where we're at. That's the trap. And I'll tell you, with more income comes more responsibilities, more oil changes, more... <laughs> Keep up, upkeep of your various things. I mean, I got a snowblower and I've got a, you know, we've all got these things. I've got the gas trimmer. Now it's springtime and it's time to do all the maintenance and all this stuff. I've, and I love all my things. <laughs> right. But it's, it's a little overwhelming with all just maintaining, let alone the church things you maintain and all the other stuff. You've got to maintain all this stuff. But we've overcomplicated our lives of our own choice. If we're spending more than we make, our lifestyle's out of place. And we don't need more money, we need more Jesus. Amen. Maybe, maybe some more parameters. Maybe a different way of thinking is what we need today. But everybody talks about finances, they always talk about more. Well, I don't know if more is the answer all the time. America, we're so wealthy. The places I go overseas, they make on average 10% what we make. One-tenth of what we make is what they make. And not yet I see them happy and serving the Lord. So I think we put this idea that somewhere in more comes more happiness, and we need to break that mentality in our lives today. Our next slide is what we need to be doing. 
We need money to serve us as we serve God. Money serves us as we serve the Lord. Building in our lifestyle a nice space. And in that space is a place where we can obey God. And when God says, I want you to support that little kid in Uganda, I want you to give them, uh, you know, the, the scholarship money, and we can just do that. When God says, it's time for go to the mission, mission trip, you can, you can take that step. When God says to obey, we can obey. That is God's will for us. That is God's will for us, that money serves us as we serve the Lord. It's a tool in the hand of us to get God's will accomplished on the earth. That's, that's God's will for us. Now, friends, maybe you're thinking, I don't even know how to get to that place. Well, over this sermon series, we're going to talk about how to get to that place. This would be a good one if you were taking notes. This would be a good one to take notes over. Because we're going to have some practicalities. We're going to show you exactly what to do. So for some of you, you know exactly how to do this. Man, more power to you. Take this information and use it as a... Uh, as a weapon to put in the lives of somebody else. If you're today going, man, this is like hitting me here, Heath. Well, that's good. Let it hit you and let's change our lives. As for us in our church, imagine an organization of Christians who are all obeying God fully. That when God says jump, we say how high, Lord. When God says do it, we say yes, Lord. Without any hindrances, without any reasons why we're able to obey God completely and fully. Imagine an organization like that. There's nothing. That de- the gates of hell shake out of people like that. Church of the Heartland, let's be those people. Now, I do want to say, in my personal life, Misty and I are, and I'm only saying this to glory to Jesus, but we're totally debt free. Every, every dime we bring in, we get to decide what to do with. Right now, an amazing amount of that goes towards my son's college. <laughs> and I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> you better get good grade taken. <laughs> but we're able to, to do that. I, I say all of that because I want you to know I'm doing what I'm preaching to you. I have done what I'm preaching to you. We don't make a lot of money, but we've cut our expenses way down so that everything that God gives us, I can obey God with, and I can do what I feel God wants me to do with it. Now, in 1996, when we got married, our, our uh, Dr. Royer, my, continues to be my mentor, was the guy that did our premarital counseling, and like 99.9% of it was on money. And I was like, are you going to talk about anything else? He's like, no, we're done. That's it? Well, when 80-something percent of divorces are based upon money, if we can just get the money solved, you're pretty much solving all the other problems, too. I didn't catch that at the time. I was just like, okay. We took the money from our, uh, from our wedding, you know, the, the little gifts they gave us, and we got out of the last little bit of debt we had at that time. Over the years, we've gone in and out of debt various times. Every time we do it, we think to ourselves, why did we do that? And we try to pay it off as soon as possible. And now, for several years now, probably five years, we haven't had any. And uh, so I want to stay. So I want to stay. Because I want to be able to obey God completely and fully with everything God gives me. Now, in the reality of that, if you see my car, listen, it's not been abandoned on the side of the road. I'm just parking it at my house, okay? <laughs> People wonder, like, no, that's, that's, it still goes. It gets there the same amount of time as anybody else's car gets there, okay? And there are some ch- decisions I'm making, and we're making, to stay out of debt in that relationship, in that way. And maybe that's not something you want to do, but here's what I want to say. See debt as not your friend. See debt as not your friend. I've heard some people say, what you need to do is pile a bunch of debt on you and then you'll, we'll, we'll, it'll help your work ethic and you'll work real hard because you have to get rid of it. <laughs> okay, so strap yourself in as much bondage as you can because that way you'll work hard to get out. No, my goodness, that is not what God wants for us. Jesus wants us free, all the weight off our shoulders, completely obedient to him. Amen? Amen. Our application slide today, be teachable when it comes to money and see whatever you have as enough. First one's be teachable, okay? Just like we started out today, there was some resistance here in the, uh, in the audience today. Ugh. And then you opened your hearts and it's, that resistance changed. 
Friends, be teachable. Be teachable. If you're in a lot of debt, like read books on how to get out of debt. I'm always surprised at how many people have like marriage problems. I'm like, well, you read a book on marriage? No. You listen to like any kind of conferences on marriage? No. So let me get this right. You've got a complete marriage problem, but any kind of help that you could get that's totally free, maybe at the library, you don't want to even do that? I'll tell you, there's expensive, like, then there's a library, it's just free. Divorce is expensive. <laughs> but if we got financial problems, friends, get the research that you need. If you're looking for one book, I think it's a lot of principles we're going to talk about in this series. Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover. Now, you can do Financial Peace University. Um, Dave Ramsey's book is at the library. It's free. It's the same exact information. <laughs> Oops, sorry, Dave. <laughs> Letting your cat out of the bag. There it is. Follow the steps. We're going to teach, teach some of those over this sermon series. Follow the steps. Baby steps, they're called, because we're little babies, <laughs> you know? We're little toddlers, barely holding on, right? Be open, be teachable. Number two, see whatever you have as enough. Just see it as enough. If God gave it to you, it's enough. He, Moses was given a staff that was enough to cross the Red Sea. David was given a sling. It was enough to kill the giant. Little boy brought his lunch to Jesus. It was enough to feed 5,000. Even if you don't think it's enough, when Jesus gives it to you, it is enough. Amen. Come on. See whatever you've got in your hands as enough. Okay, Lord, here we are. It's more than enough. Amen. If I could have every head bowed, please, and every eye closed at this time.